the Hall of Famer, Dickie V, joining us on the program. Dick, good morning. What do you remember about that first game on ESPN? Well, I remember getting there real late, Dan. I had no idea that production meetings, nobody ever told me anything. It was like chaos. So I'm walking the streets of Chicago. Finally, I come to the game. This is a true story, Dan. I come to the game about 6, I don't know, 6.20, 6.30, and the producer's going nuts. There's no iPhones in a day. He said, we've been trying to call the hotel, leave them out. I said, I haven't been at the hotel. I said, we're walking the street. I said, what's the big problem? So we got a gig. I said, we got over an hour to go. What do we I said, I said, I'm just going to talk basketball. I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, guys talking in my ear. You know, they hired jocks like us out of the locker room. And the critics start critiquing. I was lucky in that era because we didn't have critics then writing all those columns. But it worked out. 42 years, Dad, in a bank, and I just signed an extension. So I really, I've been blessed. I've been blessed, man, working with guys like you over the years and different colleagues that have helped me so much. And I've been a lucky guy. But did anybody try to make you a little more polished when you first started out? You know, not really. I think they all told me basically, uh, I remember Scotty Connell always telling me, you know, you got three things. He was like trying to convince me not to go back coaching in college. I wanted to coach in college. That's where I belong. That's where I felt my enthusiasm belonged, not the NBA. And got the Ziggy in the NBA after 12 games my second year. And I was down. I was really depressed. And I, I tell you, I was sitting home uh, feeling sorry. If it wasn't my wife kicking me out of the house, practically, when Scotty called me up to say, I want you to do our first game. Uh, he heard about me because my last game as a college coach, we played number one Michigan in the Sweet 16 when it was in the University of Detroit, and they decided to televise the game. It was NBC, Scotty Connell, doing the game. I was in awe. John Wooden's going to be the analyst. Kurt Gowdy, the legendary, <laughs> the play-by-play. And I, Dan, this is a true story. I called a me, a, my team over. I asked Scotty, I said, can I have my share a few words? to my team about the two gentlemen doing our game. And I give a five minute speech about how in sports we use the term greatness so often. I said, but this epitomizes greatness right here, 10 national championships, all kinds of Emmys in sports, right? I said, I'm honored. I'm in my thirties that people think I'm enthusiastic now. You should have seen me then. <laughs> so we go out and it was a big game for us because it was David Goliath. They wouldn't play us my first year there. We beat them and upset them, Michigan, with Campanella Russell. Remember him? Yeah. And we beat them. And after that, I couldn't get Johnny Gray to get him on a schedule. So my players, all that year, we won 21 in a row. We beat Mark Hedden two months later, won the national championship. We beat Arizona. We beat Michigan State. And my players would come in every day. Coach, coach, why can't we play Michigan? They're number one in the country. We're as good as they are. We play with those guys in the summer. I said, man, I don't want to hear it. They don't want to play us. I get here. My assistant runs in after the season's over and he hears that the pairings are out. And he comes running in my office and he says, you're going to believe this. If we get to the Sweet 16, we play Michigan. Oh my God, I called the team meeting. I got all the players down there. I said, you want Michigan? There they are. Well, we play that game and we lose a heartbreaker. I was told later by Scotty that when I got fired by the Pistons and he called me up, I wrote your name down because Kirk County and John Wooden were leaving the arena. So I love that guy's passion and spirit. And he said, you should hire him, Scotty, and TV. He said, well, I've just been named the head of a new network for remotes, hiring talent and all this. And he said, I'd like to hire you to do your first game. Oh, that's- I said, well, who? And he says, ESPN. I said to him, the true story, Dan. I said to him, ESPN. That sounds like a disease. What the hell's ESPN? Are you kidding me? And you know what? It's been a disease for me. And the four letters for me have given me a life that's exceeded any dream I ever had. What's the job you almost took to leave ESPN? Was there a head coaching job that you nearly left for? A job I was trying to get. Nobody really knew it except one guy found out. They roasted me in Detroit, the universe, to make a lot of money. And I told them, if you roast me, I'm going to pick the roasters. Jimmy V was one of my guys I picked. So Jimmy V gets up. Now he wants to be last. There's Abe Lemons, Jimmy V, Chuck Bailey. Uh, well, I had a hell of a cast. And we raised a lot of money. But Jimmy gets up. To speak at the end, he made sure he said, I want to go last. He goes in his pocket and he says, I want to read this letter to all you beautiful Titan lovers here in the University of Detroit about your coach here who you guys loved. He said, this is the letter. Dear Dick, 
we are sorry to inform you that we have decided to go in the way of hiring Jim Valvano as our next coach <laughs> at NC State. He said, put this in your memory book. <laughs> and he said he found, when he got the job there, he found that letter in the files and he wanted to make sure I had it. But no, I, I don't think I would have got the job at all, but that was a job I was interested in. But you know what, Dan? I, I didn't know. I did not know what Scotty meant. You know the business better than I and media. I just happen to be a guy talk about the game. And, and the, the bottom line is, he used to always say to me, the first couple of years I was there, don't you don't don't leave this. He said, you got something that's rare. You connect with people, whether they agree with you or disagree. They're going to the water cooler and they say, you and Dick Vitale said about that thing. And I didn't know what he meant. 1983, they assigned me ESPN my first my first final four. I go there, Houston's playing down there, Jimmy V, Louisville, Georgia, and pictures, people coming up with pictures and autographs and all this. And I, I couldn't believe that. And Scott, he says, did I tell you, can I? That was the moment that I said to myself, you know what? I love what I'm doing. And right now, I'll tell you what, they can talk about Krzyzewski. They can talk about all these great coaches and their records. I got the best damn record 42 years. I haven't lost the game. <laughs> I have not lost the game. And I coach every team in America, UCLA, Kentucky, North Carolina. <laughs> I coach them all. You got Gonzaga trying to go from, uh, you know, wire to yeah. wire here. And uh, I know we love to compare teams and generations. And, you know, to me, I just say enjoy this. If Gonzaga goes undefeated, enjoy seeing something you haven't seen in a long time. Um why is it we want to – it feels like people want to diminish what Gonzaga could be attempting to do uh, by going undefeated. Why is that? Well, that's just sports fanatics. You know, sitting like when you argue, for example, a baseball player becomes great. How would he compare with Willie Mays? How would he compare with Mickey Mantle? That's just the way of life in sports. But I agree with you. Everything should be related to the era. Right now, they're the best of the best. And so somebody can prove – can put them on an L on their uh, register. I said before the season's – started. I said it during the season. And I said it basically before the tournament started. Actually, I said 32 and 0 was happening. They're just that good. Offensively, Dan, they execute so well. There's a stat that really impresses me. They lead the nation in assists, 18 per game. Know what that tells me, Dan? They're unselfish. They share the ball. They love playing with each other. And they're much better defensively than people believe. And then the cry you'll always get, well, who do they beat in their conference? Well, Take a look what they beat pre-conference. Kansas blew them. They, took, they blew off them. They took out uh, uh, certainly Kansas, Virginia, my memory tells me, Iowa blew them off. They can play. They can play. And you know what they got going as well? Nobody talks about. I think they're fresh because the conference wasn't as competitive as what you've seen in the Big Ten and these various conferences. So they come into the tournament, I think, physically a lot fresher than other teams. And they're just a dynamite team. Now, would they be the greatest team of all time? I don't think there's any shape or form that they would beat Lou Alcinda and UCLA because nobody, Lou Alcinda can take you, me, and take Todd <laughs> Fritz, your guy, take Paul, and you know what? We got a chance, Dad. We got a chance. <laughs> We're talking to Dick Vitale, the ESPN College uh, basketball analyst, uh, signing a two-year contract extension at the Mothership. Three years, Dan. Oh, three. three. Oh, oh, wow. I made a mistake. My bad. Uh, <laughs> wait, did ESPN make the mistake that you signed a three-year? Or two year, or did I make no, the mistake? I, I, uh, you know, you were right what you reported. There was an error there in the initial uh, uh, release press but, release. Uh, okay. It doesn't matter. Three okay. years for. I hope I have another day tomorrow. I mean, when you're 81 years old, Dan, you just hope you have another day. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is why Roy Williams retired, but he had one of his star players who is uh, deciding to transfer. His seven footer out of Georgia. Um, and this transfer portal was interesting with college basketball. Where do you, th where is the sport headed with the transfer portal? We've seen this in football, certainly with quarterbacks, now with uh, basketball players. And it's the worst thing that's ever happened to college basketball. I just put up five tweets in a row today on Twitter. If they go to Dickie V, they can see them, five of them. How it's really got me now. To be honest with you, I'm upset big time about it. Because first of all, we've given a bad message to kids. Look, I understand some cases transfer should happen. Just like I put on Twitter, in real life sometimes, the best thing for the couple is the divorce. I mean, that's just the way of life. So sometimes a transfer is good. Then I'll hear the argument all the time. Well, coaches leave and they're eligible right away to play. Why shouldn't players? 
Well, it's not apples to apples, Dan. We got right now, today, today, 1,100 players in the transfer portal. You don't have 1,100 coaches. Come on. So here, I, I got a solution for that problem. If a coach leaves or if he's fired, those players should be automatically eligible to transfer if that's their desire. Okay. So now you wipe that argument out. It's creating such chaos, no stability. It used to be years ago, you know, a player's not getting play in time, and you can understand it. But now we got starters. They won't want to be recruited again, both being chased and dined and won. And no one's going to get hurt the most in schools like Dayton, Detroit. They get a player to rise to become a real star talent. You can guarantee word will get out to those kids. Hey, think about going to this school in the ACC or this school in the Big Ten, and kids are going to jump. I think we're teaching kids, hey, we're teaching kids to quit when things get tough. Life is tough. Life's not all smooth. Right now, we got a pandemic of close to 600,000 lives. We got people, friends of yours, friends of mine, lost their jobs. But you know what? You got to rally in tough times. They're teaching kids, oh, pack the bags, go. And if you were a coach today, you look at the kid the wrong way. He says, you know, I'm going to transfer portal. I just think it's the worst thing to hit college. And you know what? I had some calls yesterday from coaches. They're up to here with it. They're frustrated. You made a good point about Roy Williams. I certainly don't believe that's the only thing. But I got to believe. I remember remember talking to Roy about, oh, God, a month ago before doing one of your games. And we were talking on Zoom. And we talked about the transfer portal. And he's totally against it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just really not healthy for the game of basketball. It's just not healthy at all. And I don't think it's healthy for everybody involved. Mark Few has said, has told me that he's had players transfer to him. Sitting out the year yeah. was the best thing that happened to them. And then we became pros. They developed. What happened about developing players? Well, I don't know what's going to happen when we get rid of the one and done. Like, is basketball going to be better when we get rid of the one and done? You know, I, I, I'm just worried about the state of the game. And I think what we need in basketball, and I put this on Twitter too, we need a czar. We need somebody representing college basketball, dealing with the NCAA, dealing when issues come up, dealing with the NBA about the one and done. And I got the perfect candidate. I mean, you can't get a better candidate. Jay Billis. Roy Williams. No, Roy Jay Williams. Billis. Well, Jay would be great, too. No, he's a lawyer. Yeah, But Jay isn't going to give up the luxury of TV for that. Roy <laughs> Williams, though, is available. Why would Jay give up working a TV? It's like stealing money working what we do. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to see Billis in that role because, you know, you got to listen to both sides. And, uh, you know, I always appreciate that Billis has a well-thought-out answer. And I just don't think – I think that the NCAA is rudderless. There, there's, there's nobody guiding the ship here. And that's what concerns me, not just basketball, but sports, you know, across well, the board. Dan, I, I agree with you a lot about Jay. Jay's a brilliant mind, does a great job. I mean, I, he's just not going to leave for something like that. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I have a real problem with something else. You, you got me today where I've got fired up. Coaches out there have been allegations about cheating, about transcript frauds, all those factors. This happened Five years ago, it's been discussed since the FBI investigation started, and no decision's been made. Mm -hmm. Here it is five years. When did they make decisions, the NCAA? I don't understand. You know, talking they got to go to this committee, that committee. Give me a break. I mean, if you can't solve those problems within a year and a half, two years, there's something wrong. Something wrong with the system. And the system's got to get fixed. And they better get on this transfer portal thing. We should know what, Dan? I think by come July, we'll have close to 2,000 kids transfer. It's every day you pick it up. Another kid is, I'm going to transfer portal. I'm going to get recruited again. Wow. Can you imagine, Dan, you play in a date and you're on a transfer portal? They'll all be chasing you for that jump shot you had. They they wanted me to get in the transfer portal, Dick. They, <laughs> they asked me to leave. That was the problem. Yes. Uh, hey, congrats uh, on the contract extension, and uh, always always great to talk to you, Dick. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And one last thing, if I could just say this to you, Dan, quickly. If people can help me raise money for kids battling cancer for the V Foundation, just go to dickvitale.com. They can make a donation. It goes to the V Foundation. So far, we raised $37 million, and I need a lot of help right now, especially with the pandemic. So go to dickvitale.com. Thank you, buddy.